All right, so welcome back to Paleo. Uh, we're going to continue going on through this material here for exam three. We talked about paleoecology last time, and now we're going to talk about evolutionary paleoecology, so ecology evolving through time. And then, of course, we're going to go in through biogeography next week after the exam. And then we're going to talk about some biostratigraphy stuff. So let's get right into it. Hope everybody's doing well and staying safe and staying inside and uh, definitely uh, be sure you're interacting on the discussion board. So, uh, so some announcements. Any questions? I don't hear anybody asking questions. Oh yeah, that's right. You're not here with me. So I guess, uh, again, if you do have questions, discussion board, good place to do that. All right, so I click a review question. So obviously uh, the eye clickers are not gonna work because everyone is working at different times here, but uh, I still wanna do something like it. So which of these terms describes the role slash function that an organism fills? So what's like an organism's job? So is it community, ecosystem, habitat, or niche? Which one of those terms describes the organism's function. So think back to last week's, or sorry, last Wednesday's lecture. Which one of those is the organism's job? Five, four, three, two, one. It is a niche. So niche is the organism's job, the role that it does, how it makes its living. Habitat is similar, but habitat is where it lives. So habitat is like the address. The ecosystem are these large scale uh, kind of global things that share very similar environmental factors. And then community is a little bit more local. Okay, so those are very important terms. Make sure that you're comfortable with those going forward. And of course, haha, funny cartoon. <laughs> All right, so evolutionary paleoecology. What are we talking about today? So last time we kind of mentioned that it's very interesting and it's very cool to study in depth a fossil community, but with all the assumptions that go into that and all the difficulties, uh, it, it, it sometimes isn't all that productive in many ways. But the thing that it really helps with is that if we look at many of these communities over time and analyze many of these communities, we start to see some of these large scale long term changes. So how are communities, how are organisms' relationships with each other and with the environment changing over time? What's happening? What is the difference, basically? So again, with the analog to evolution, evolution is more of like a species-based concept. This is more of like a community and ecosystem-based concept. We're moving up that scale. And evolutionary paleoecology is somewhat like macroecology where just like macroevolution looks at long-term changes like say speciation we're looking at long-term changes in communities and how they uh, change through time so again kind of moving up this scale larger scale larger time frames so again it's ecology over time so what kind of changes do we observe with looking at macroecology or evolutionary paleoecology, if you'd like to use that term. So one thing that we see is that there are changes in the community structure and there are changes in the way that the food web is sort of arranged. So if you look at modern environments, you see like apex predators up at the top and then the broad base. And we talked about some of those caveats last time, but we see that We've sort of assumed that that's the way that it's always been through time, and mostly it has, but the details have definitely changed. There are definitely differences. So what are those differences and how do those differences kind of manifest themselves over time? Another thing that we see is changes in biodiversity. So just how many different organisms are there and uh, how many are kind of competing for that same kind of space. Uh, another thing that we see is trends in, in habitat. So we see changes, we see differences in who is living where. So which organisms are like occupying the beach, which are occupying the deep abyssal plain, which are occupying the middle and outer shelf, 
uh, those things change through time and it's sort of interesting how they change and it gives us some information about the ancient environments. Uh, we talked a little bit about niches uh, last time, but another thing that we see is that niche tiering that we talked about, that sort of changes through time as well. So organisms sort of start exploiting new roles and filling new niches, and it's very interesting how that evolves through long periods of time. Another very interesting question that paleoecology, evolutionary paleoecology can address. Another thing that we can see, again, with the benefit of these long time scales, is escalation. So this constant predator-prey arms race, who's going to win? So predators get a little bit better, prey has to get a little bit better in response. And so there's kind of this standoff, this, this, all, this constant contest between them. And again, the stakes are pretty high, life and death, right? So, um, and then the last thing that we're going to talk about that kind of changes through time that's very interesting is changes in, in biomass just how much, how much organism is there, how much present uh, organism is, is, is in the ecosystem, and that's also changed through time, which is fairly interesting. So the food pyramid kind of reshuffles, it's tiering a little bit, it, it, it changes in what's active at what tiers, uh, but it also just the size of the pyramid changes, and we'll, we'll, how much biomass is actually present, so interesting. So ch -ch -ch changes through time, that's what we're looking at today. So community interactions are one thing that definitely changes with time. They appear to have gotten more complicated. So if we look back at our Ordovician food web that we talked about last time, um, you know, there's, again, the basics are the same. There's nutrients at the bottom, uh, inorganic nutrients, and, and things like sunlight taken in by the producers at the bottom here, the phytoplankton, zooplankton consume those, moving up to the filterers, uh, grazers that feed on the plants, and then the carnivores at the top here that feed on there. Um, what we see is that there's a couple, you know, a few organisms that fill each role at each tier, and there's not like a great diversity here comparing it to like a more modern food chain where we have the phytoplankton at the bottom, zooplankton, that's fairly similar. Um, but there is filterers, herbivores, swimming herbivores, there's large uh, swimming herbivores, large swimming predators at varieties of different scales. So there's smaller predators, kind of medium tier predators, and then there's the top apex predators uh, that structuring really is sort of absent in the Ordovician. Really, the, the apex predator at this time is really like these uh, orthoconic, the straight-shelled nautiloids, and, and that's really about it. Uh, they don't have a lot of competition for that role, and basically organisms below them only really have to adapt to protect themselves from that predator, because it's the only real enemy that they have. Um, so there's this appearance that things get more complex over time, and oh, there's been a little bit of a debate about whether this is actually just a pull of the recent. So um, what that means is that we're able to, if we want to examine a modern food web, we go out and we look at it directly. If we want to examine the interactions in the ancient food web, we can't do that. So we have a more thorough understanding of a modern food web. And so we know and we realize and we observe that it's very complex and hard to understand. It, it appears to be simpler in the ancient world, but is that just that we maybe aren't seeing the whole picture? Uh, probably not. Uh, there is probably some of that artifact of the poll of the recent where um, we're seeing a little bit more and we're maybe missing some pieces from the ancient, but it really does seem like there is that pattern where things are getting a little bit more complicated over time. So some of those reasons we'll examine in some of the other slides here. And one of them is that there appears to just be more organisms. So biodiversity, so the diversity of biology, how many taxa there are, how many different organism species there are, appears to have increased over time. Uh, th there's this general upwards trend. So starting back here in the late Precambrian, there is almost nothing. Not nothing, but almost nothing. And then at the start of the Cambrian, we have this pretty rapid ramp up 
and then there's a couple fits and starts but in general there's this overall upward trend but as we pointed out there are some very abrupt interruptions so the one that really jumps out is this one right here at the end of remember p is for permian in the permian going into the triassic that end permian mass extinction the great dying um, that's a very abrupt uh, drop in biodiversity and then afterwards there's a pretty rapid radiation to kind of bring back some of that diversity and to get up to like kind of modern levels uh, there's been a lot of discussion about whether this is a pull of the recent artifact as well and it certainly is to some extent so modern rocks are a little bit more accessible there's more of them it's easier there's less taphonomic effects because they're just not as old they haven't gone through as much much less likely to have been tectonically deformed much less likely to have been subducted and destroyed uh, it's a lot easier to observe modern fossils or recent fossils than it is ancient there's a lot less of them uh, so therefore there's also a little bit more interest in them and so just there's a bias in just what we're studying it's harder to study the ancient fossil record and so just less people do it there's less rock exposure it makes it makes it a lot trickier there's more of those artifacts that we've been talking about all semester they have to remove so if you want to understand these communities uh, most people tend to look at the communities that are a little bit more intact, a little bit less disturbed. And so there's definitely this bias. Uh, how much of this curve is the result of that poll recent is, is definitely debatable. Um, but I think the trend is, is really not. Uh, the trend is, is probably real. That general increasing in biodiversity over time is, is real. And so what we see is you know, there's these three kind of distinct faunas through time that sort of dominate. So early on in the Cambrian, the kind of first, like real true animals, uh, not a lot of diversity here. There's trilobites, there's inarticulate brachiopods, there's some ancient things that resemble mollusks, and some very primitive crinoids. And that's really about it. I mean, there's sponges around and there's some corals around and things like that. But these are the dominant uh, factors here. And then we shift at the end of the Cambrian, we kind of shift into more of a Paleozoic fauna. These are the things that we're kind of more used to seeing around here, where articulate brachiopods, the ones with the straighter hinges, are more dominant. Uh, lots of crinoids, uh, rugose corals, uh, we get some coiled cephalopods, and uh, you know, trilobites are still present, but they start uh, trailing off a little bit. Um, and then we start seeing some of these like sea stars and things kind of coming into the record. And then there's this massive change over here at the end of the Permian. And we shift into, you know, the Paleozoic fauna is still there. There are still remnants of it even to this day, but it starts being replaced by the modern fauna. So thinking of like crustaceans, bivalves, gastropods, those are really the dominant, uh, dominant species. And then obviously like fish and sharks and marine reptiles and mammals sort of started to take over. Um, so you see over time, what is living in the ocean changes pretty dramatically and the number of things seems to change pretty dramatically. And again, there is sort of this whole the recent, we're able to directly observe these critters living now. Uh, it's a little harder with the Cambrian. Again, the farther you go back, the less complete the picture is, the more pages of the history book have been torn out. But still, the trend, the overall trend seems to hold up. So another thing that changes is really uh, what I like to call like niche opportunity space is like the different roles, like how many different roles are available for organisms to fill. And really the number of niches available hasn't like appreciably changed but how many are occupied and unoccupied definitely has. So if you go back to the Cambrian, so the Cambrian fauna, and this picture is a little bit blurry, apologize for that. Uh, if we look at, so pelagic, so swimmers, things that are in the water column, uh, suspension feeders, really only like the trilobites are filling that role. Uh, herbivorous pelagic critters just don't really exist. There's nothing to fill that role. 
there's no swimming herbivores present in the Cambrian. In the textbook, it says there's no swimming carnivores, although I'm not sure why they didn't include Anomalocaris on there, probably the first real true apex predator, but really not a lot of competition for that role. Um, but yeah, so this role here is completely unfilled. And then we go to the epifauna. So remember epi, like epidermis, the outside of your skin. Epifauna are things that live on the outside of the seafloor. Uh, suspension, mobile suspension feeders don't exist. Mobile carnivores uh, don't really exist either on the seafloor. Uh, I'm sure that there's actually a couple of things that fill that role, but um, not a lot anyways. Uh, deposit feeders, things like trilobites, ostracods. So that role is filled by a couple organisms, but not a lot of real com competition uh, attached. There's the brachiopods, both inarticulate and articulated, and then attached erect, uh, like crinoids, and then uh, reclining. I'm not even sure what that really means. I guess like some laying in the mud a little bit. I should have looked that up, sorry. Um, but then we get to the infauna, so in fauna are things that live in the mud, and there's really not a lot there at all. Uh, no shallow passive in fauna, so none that are passively feeding shallowly, no deep at all, nothing deep. Um, so that's the Cambrian fauna, a lot of unfilled niches, a lot of things that are going unexploited. And then we go to the Paleozoic fauna, and you'll notice that, okay, well, there's still this blank space here for pelagic herbivores that's really not filled until like the devonian when like fish start filling that role and then the infauna again we're having a lot of gaps here in the infauna uh not there's still not a lot of things that are exploiting like inside the sediment uh and then going to epifauna we'll notice that okay all the niches are filled now there's no empty boxes and then also every box has a lot of critters in it. So not only are more of these roles being filled, but they're being filled by more different, diverse, varied organisms. And so competition is increasing, diversity is increasing probably as a response to that. Uh, but basically just over time, more and more of these niches are filled. If you look at uh, a, a more modern environment, all these boxes are checked and they're all checked by multiple organisms. And if you go back to the Cambrian, again, there's just so much unfilled space here. And it just, over time, organisms become a little bit more specialized, uh, trying to exploit these varied niches. They kind of like figure things out, they solve the puzzle. Like how do we access, again, nutrients are limited. So if you can figure out how to access nutrients that no one else could before, uh, that's a big advantage. And uh, it took a while to, to solve some of these puzzles. How do you exploit the resources that are trapped underneath the seafloor? It took a long time for organisms to figure that out. How do we actively capture plant life floating around in the water column? It took a little while for organisms to figure that out. Okay. Uh, another thing that happens, so we kind of talked about this with the ducks a little bit, uh, with the, the, very, the ducks are at the various niches with the flamingos being able to exploit deep and then like the oyster catchers and stuff a little bit shallower. Um, but basically organisms are getting more and more specialized over time. They're exploiting different parts of their environment. So like looking at this figure here, uh, initially in the Neoproterozoic, everything's basically on the seafloor. Nothing's in the seafloor, nothing's too high above the seafloor, everything is basically on the seafloor. All the action is going on on the seafloor. And then in the Cambrian, we start, okay, well, we can dig burrows a little bit, you know, not a lot, but it's happening. Shallow burrows, things are starting to exploit the shallow sediment. Things are starting to grow a little bit off of the seafloor. And then in the Ordovician, things start swimming a bit. And then in the Devonian, there's really this whole like revolution with Necton, the swimmers, and it's like the age of fish and fish really starts filling that role. So it's really like, initially, the space available for organisms is like a, a, essentially a, a 2D environment. It's the seafloor, 
And over time, organisms figure out how to get higher off the seafloor or even swim up in the water column. They also figure out how to dig into the seafloor. And so the, over time, the niches uh, become more three-dimensional. Instead of only being able to exploit exactly what's on the seafloor, you have things kind of reaching up in to the water column and things digging down in to the sediment. And so in the Cambrian, it's a very flat 2D space. Crinoids start reaching up a little bit and then getting into the late Paleozoic, crinoids are really starting to reach up. There's these large crinoids. Uh, they kind of die back at the Permian and then they make like a rebound. They really haven't reached that since the Mesozoic. Um, but we do have other animals, that, organisms that sort of reach up and fill that role, not quite as well as these crinoids. Uh, we see basically no burrowing initially, then very shallow burrows. And then all of a sudden we get these really deep burrows from like uh, really uh, deep burrowing bivalves, crustaceans, uh, digging, exploiting, uh, making these like very deep burrows, exploiting all of that resource that's available digging deeper and deeper and deeper into the seafloor and higher and higher and higher up into the water column. So even the other thing we see is that within the single niche, now remember that this kind of like 3D world now that we're in, it's opening up these niches, probably to like a single or a couple organisms at first. Uh, but once that niche is open, things start exploiting it the number of organisms competing for that space increases. And so like this is sort of a modern example where at every one of these tiers, you know, low in the water column to high in the water column, uh, there's a lot of different organisms that are competing for that space. So they've sort of, just like those ducks, the example from last time, they've sort of developed these strategies to exploit slightly differently. So if you look at the seafloor, there's like low level suspension feeders that are just a little bit off the seafloor. They're sort of like these little higher, like the big old clams here, uh, intermediate suspension feeders, and then crinoids and things like that. Seagrasses really exploiting resources that are a little bit higher up. So the niches have gone three dimensional. The opportunity space has opened up and there's more organisms now fighting to fill those roles. And so things need to get a little bit more specialized to kind of win that battle. And again, it sort of starts this like arms race. Uh, so another thing that we see that's interesting is organisms start living, well, the organisms that are living in different parts of the ecosystem changes over time. Uh, one of the ones that's elaborated pretty heavily on the textbook is this like onshore, offshore uh, pattern. And so if we go back to the Cambrian, there's really not a lot of stuff going on, but uh, it's really like a trilobite rich fauna. There's inarticulate brachiopods, there's crinoids, uh, there's this, you know, Cambrian fauna. And then we get into Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, the Paleozoic fauna starts taking over. It's very brachiopod rich with some corals, some crinoids, bryozoans. The trilobites are still there. Uh, but they've been kind of pushed offshore. And so what we see is that really the inner shelf tends to be more dynamic. So the inner shelf, think of the inner shelf environment near the beach. Uh, it's affected by storms. It's affected by currents. It's much easier to be affected by um, changes in water chemistry. Uh, it's more, it's just a more sensitive environment. It's more subject to change. And of course, if an environment is more prone to change, the organisms have to be able to adapt to that change. And it probably leads to more speciation, uh, more diversification. They, they need to exploit the differing roles and they need to respond to changes quickly. Whereas in the more stable parts of the deep basin, maybe you don't need to do that as much. And so some of the more stable, more long-term, long-lived, older species are sort of like moving farther and farther and deeper and deeper where they don't necessarily have to change as much. And so what we see is that over time, like here bivalves is a relatively new thing. They start in the inner shelf and then over time they start to keep kind of like pushing, 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 pushing those older organisms kind of offshore. 
um, the newer organisms are taking over the inner shelf, the more dynamic environment, and they're pushing the older forms offshore. And then right after the Permian, there's this radical change, uh, which we'll see on the next, on the next slide here. Um, but all of a sudden, what was dominated by brachiopods uh, now is dominated more by mollusks. And so if you look at an ancient Paleozoic rock, all the quote unquote seashells that you see, most of them are brachiopods, a large portion of brachiopods. And if you go to a modern beach, uh, it's almost all bivalves and an occasional gastropod in there. So the, the habitat's fairly similar, but who's filling it and where has changed. And then there's this idea of this escalation. So thinking back to like uh, United States and Russia in their kind of like Cold War, there was like that, the mad policy, the mutually assured destruction. Uh, we build a bomb and they build another bomb. Actually, they build probably two bombs. They build two bombs, we build four bombs and you know, up and up and up and up and up. So there's, we also kind of see this escalation with predators and prey over time the predators develop more better weapons. So like think about the Cambrian, Anomalocaris um, has those like mouth parts there and like his, the, the uh, oral cone, um, not a lot of weapons to like pry things open or exploit a lot of those hard shelled things. Um, as predators get a little bit better, so like they develop like crushing jaws or like starfish with the able to like pull shells open snails being able to like kind of dig through the shells. Uh, predators develop more weapons. They're able to better attack prey. And so prey start developing in response to that, they start developing protection, like uh, maybe thicker shells or maybe spiny shells, or they develop evasive strategies. So they're able to like swim away or jump away or move or burrow for protection. Uh, that may be why you start exploiting the deeper parts of the sediment is because they're actually trying to just get away and like, oh, hey, there's food here too. Um, but basically the species that don't change are left behind. So like a zebra is uh, always in competition to not get eaten by the lion. Uh, if one day they evolve the ability to ride on motorcycles, uh, that's probably going to be a pretty good uh, thing for them. They can probably outrun. Uh, probably not going to happen, but, but yeah, it's, it's just the idea that Predators are getting better. Predators get better, they get more specialized, they've got all these new weapons. The prey have to develop responses as well. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean that they get hardier, they might just get faster or develop better ways of hiding. So like camouflaging, things like that becomes more important in this arms race. And so one of the things that we saw, so we, we talked on the last slide about habitat changes. So again, Paleozoic brachiopods dominate so again, Paleozoic shellfish, you're thinking about brachiopods. Modern shellfish, you're thinking about bivalves. There's this big switch over here. One potential reason for this switch over is that brachiopods are relatively sessile. Um, so they have that pedicle that they stick out and kind of anchor in. Some don't even really have that, but they don't really move around a lot. Uh, one thing we'll see when we get to the bivalve lab is that bivalves are actually fairly mobile. They're surprisingly mobile. You think about like a, a seashell and you think that, you know, it just opens up and feeds. Uh, they're actually surprisingly, they get around quite well. They can use that big foot to kind of like jump. Uh, they can clap the shell to kind of swim. Uh, not all of them, like oysters kind of encrusted just kind of stay there, but um, a lot of bivalves are surprisingly mobile. Uh, so one thing that might be is that as predators improved throughout geologic time, the brachiopods that were favored, uh, all of a sudden they don't have as many different escape strategies. They're not as good at burrowing. They really don't swim. Uh, they can't move around as much as the bivalves can. And that's probably one of the reasons why the bivalves take over. And brachiopods do still exist today, but they're pretty limited, at least compared to bivalves. Uh, so interesting. There's always this like give and take here. Predators get better, prey has to get better in response, or they're not going to be around anymore. Another thing that changes is just the overall biomass. So there's this trend over time towards fleshier and fleshier 
fleshier and then maybe a little bit larger through time, there is more meat available. So the old commercial, I think it was Wendy's, the where's the beef, uh, in the early parts of Paleozoic, and think back to the Cambrian, so this is like a Cambrian scene here, uh, looking at these critters, where's the beef? There is a lot of shell material here, uh, looking at these like pointy, spiky, shelly, shelly, uh, sponges, basically spicules, not a lot to go on there, some solitary corals, crinoids are basically all those hard ossicles with very little organic material. Um, for the predators that exist at this time, where's the beef? There's not a lot of stuff to really eat. Um, they can eat those shelly creatures, but it takes a lot of energy and the payoff is pretty small. So one reason why those massive, large apex predators don't really exist at this time is probably just because there's very little seafood around. Uh, there's not a lot of delicious, yummy, fleshy organisms to, to exploit. As we move kind of further along into the Devonian, you see that, okay, well now we've got these kind of large predators, these uh, plated fish here, uh, starting to exploit some of these things. Mm, that looks pretty tasty right there. Not very shelly, not very organic, or not very uh, armored. Uh, we do still have like, you know, shelled stuff, but there's a little bit more biomass here. There's a little bit more beef. There's more stuff to eat. Uh, it's a lot, there's a, the payoff eating like this starfish here is a lot more than say eating like one of these brachiopods or something. We saw in the brachiopod lab, especially some of those concave ones, they're relatively thin. There's not a lot of meat in there. And then also with the brachiopods, half their shell is for filtering. So really the organic yummy parts is really only half of that. So trying to find one of these brachiopods, open it up, and then eat it, it's a relatively laborious process. And then the payoff is pretty small. So it takes a lot of energy. You're not getting a lot of energy back. So you can't be this big hulking factory that needs a lot of energy. And then as things get meatier, we can become a little bit larger. And that's probably the trend that we're seeing is that over time, we trend towards these fleshier, more delicious, nom 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 nom, organisms. Uh, and then the last thing that we're gonna talk about today is that, so we've talked about all these changes. We've talked about these changes that we see and there was kind of this debate, again, similar to the evolution debate. In fact, these are slides from the evolution debate. Uh, are these changes nice and gradual over time, or are they the kind of the punctuated equilibrium model? So Carlton Brett and Gordon Baird, who worked at SUNY Fredonia, I think he just retired, um, so big contributions from our SUNY system. Uh, they propose that changes in communities resemble observed changes in species. So uh, the same kind of patterns that species follow, the changes in communities sort of resemble that. So it's not like this steady, gradual change towards like better and better, better, better animals or exploiting the 3D environment more and more and more and more or getting meteor and meteor and meteor and meteor over time. It's that there is these long periods where everything kind of stays the same. Something abrupt changes in the environment and then something abrupt changes in the community in response. So again, same kind of pattern that we see in speciation and species we see in communities. So again, long periods of stasis, no change. Uh, the community rel remains relatively stable. Maybe you swap one organism in for another. So like one burrowing, shallow burrowing brachiopod goes extinct and you fill in another one or like one kind of trilobite goes extinct and you just sub in a new trilobite. Uh, the community behaves similarly. Similar roles are still filled. The diversity hasn't really gone up or down because you're just swapping in and out. So that's a period of stasis. Everything kind of stays the same. There's not a lot of abrupt changes in how the ecosystem works, how the community like interacts with the environment. The ecology is sort of in stasis 
then the environmental factors start shifting. They shift in some cases abruptly. And in some cases we see the community is just not changing in response. So again, just like with evolution, there's this idea that animals have like this kind of like infinite flexibility to change in response to changing conditions. And we see that even in the face of dramatically changed conditions, a lot of organisms stay the same. They just don't change. And we see that same kind of thing with communities where community stays relatively stable, environment starts changing, the community is not changing in response or not changing fast enough, and that community is no more, and it's replaced by a new community. So like that big changeover from the brachiopod dominated fauna to now the bivalve dominated fauna, uh, that was a relatively abrupt shift. So uh, at the end of the Permian, uh, it was brachiopod dominant all the way up till there. Uh, bivalves were gradually increasing, but uh, there was a dramatic shift over. So that's all that I got for today for evolutionary paleoecology. Just remember that the test, uh, the exam two, uh, this material is not going to be on there. So the lecture today and the one from Wednesday, that's not going to be on the test. So you have the study topics sheet, all that stuff's going to be on there. Again, the format's going to be a little bit different from the previous tests, but pretty similar. And uh, I hope you enjoy your weekend. And I, I hope that everyone is staying sane and staying safe. Just remember to, you know, there was a lot of stuff we covered today. If you found something interesting, go post about a discussion board. If you found something confusing, go post about a discussion board. If someone's asking a question, and you know the answer, or you're confused by the same thing, post about discussion board. So let's, uh, it's a good place for um, discussing, that's the word, yes. So it's a board for discussing things. So let's use that to its fullest. And then the last thing is this disclaimer, which I always have to show to make sure that it's in the video. Again, this is not on the test. So have a good weekend, enjoy. Uh, miss you guys, but hopefully this is at least somewhat resembling the classroom experience. Uh, so take it easy, flatten that curve. Good luck, stay safe, bye.